morning, I'm Carol Randolph, and welcome to Morning Break. What has happened to L. Ron Hubbard, founder of one of the world's wealthiest and most controversial religious groups, Scientology? One of the issues to be discussed this morning with my first guest, Ron DeWolf, who's the son of the missing L. Ron Hubbard. Let's give him a big round of applause, please. <laughs> welcome. In 1972, you alleged in court papers that your father had lived a life characterized by severe mental illness and physical disease, consistent failure and the use of false and fraudulent off-time criminal means to cover up these failures and to acquire wealth, fame, and power in order to destroy his perceived enemies. What made you uh, draw those conclusions? What did you see that led you to that? Because I lived it. 99% um, of what my... Uh father wrote and said about himself is totally untrue. Uh, and uh, millions of people have uh, taken this uh, false data over a period of 30 some odd years uh, and relied upon it and uh, built a set of beliefs and built an organization and uh, basically those allegations that I made were true because throughout up to 1959 I was deeply involved in all of it. Did, what did you see specifically? I mean, give me an example when you say criminal means. Like, for example, what did you see? Fraud and deception, uh, the uh, involvement with, in the early days in Phoenix, Arizona, for an example, in 1952, the involvement with uh, organized crime, uh, the... Uh, organized crime in what capacity? The uh, use of Scientology money, his own money, uh, to uh, finance uh, uh, drug importations into the country from Mexico and Colombia. You saw these things? Yes, I was involved with uh, several of the incidents. You recorded any of this? Uh, you have papers to prove? Could you walk into court and prove any of these allegations? I didn't think for years that I could. Most of it I thought was buried, but I think now uh, since I have been speaking out that there has been uh, evidence being brought forward proving those allegations. Why did you leave the church? Because of these allegations, these things that you... I no, well, I left the church for a whole wide variety of reasons. It isn't a, a very simple answer. Um, I left because uh, my wife wanted me to. <laughs> and uh, uh, also because I wasn't making any money, because all the money flows, of course, to my father always has. Uh, I was also tired of the fraud and the deception, plus the, his deep involvement in um, uh, personal use of drugs on himself and others, uh, black magic. Uh, when you say black magic, what are you talking about? I mean, some of the things that I read in the stack of material, it sounds just absolutely unbelievable. What are you talking about when you say this? Well, the funny thing is, is that the actual truth is, is about as far out as, uh, as Scientology itself. Uh, Really, the basis of Scientology, which is rather hidden and covered over, is uh, the occult, uh, the uh, uh, deep involvement with uh, satanic uh, powers that he felt that uh, he was deeply involved with uh, uh, a uh, British uh, black magician called Alistair Crowley, uh, and through putting himself in deep hypnotic trances and the use of drugs on himself, he wanted to become the most powerful uh, being in the world. Did you consider all of this a religion? Do no. you now? Hmm? No. Why not? Because it's a business. Uh, it always has been. Uh, I was one of the incorporators of one of the original uh, church organizations, and we incorporated just because the AMA <coughs> and the uh, IRS uh, were uh, giving him a lot of problems in the early 50s. What was your relationship like with your father? I mean, for a lot of people, they would say, well, maybe you're doing all of this because you did not have a good relationship with your father, or, or maybe you're doing all this for the money. Why, why are you taking these stands? Because I want to see the, uh, the truth, and I can't expose my father without exposing myself. I mean, my life is uh, uh, pretty messed up and goofy anyway, um, and uh, in actual fact, who really belongs in this chair is L. Ron Hubbard my father, but why I'm doing it is um, 
let's lay all the facts out and let people decide. I have a copy of a letter that, that uh, supposedly came from your father where he talks about the fact that your mother was an alcoholic and that she deserted both of you and that you were not in any position to know about him or the church. Do you believe this is an authentic letter, first of all? I really don't know, but I know that he has these facts all fouled up. Such as? Well, that he didn't know me very well. Um, the fact is, from 1952 to 1959, I was very instrumental in and around the organization and the formation of it. I was director of training, uh, taught many, better than 20 advanced clinical courses. Uh, I was chief instructor, uh, traveled uh, to England uh, half a dozen times, lived with him. And so that so I you're find saying that you're in a position to really know your father and the church and the workings of the church? Oh, yes, very much so. Why? Why do you believe now that, or do you believe now that your father is alive? I personally don't believe so, but uh, uh, I really don't know. Uh, that's just, as I said, a personal belief, but I think that uh, if he is alive, uh, he is certainly quite incompetent to handle his own affairs and is being grossly manipulated by the people around him. People such as? Well, in my petition, we named, I believe, uh, a 22-year-old uh, boy with about a ninth grade education named David Miscavige was one of them. Now this is a person who belongs to what is called now the Sea Organization, is that correct? Yes, the Sea Org. Uh, and uh, that is the uh, it's sort of uh, could be considered the uh, SS arm. Now would you explain that? I mean, who are these people and why have you labeled them that? because they're very much parallel uh, uh, a Hitlerite type organization. And you realize that's very difficult for us to understand that. Here we are sitting in America today in the year eight, uh, 1983, and you're telling us that there's a group of young people who are like the SS. Mm -hmm. Why, I mean, how were they indoctrinated? Where were these young people? Where, you know, where would they have gotten this, this concept from? Gotten it from my father. Uh, the, uh, they were raised in Scientology and all they've known is Scientology and my father and uh, were they isolated from uh, the outside world altogether not altogether but pretty much uh, kept in a very tight group uh, and of course outside contact and outside communication has always been uh, uh, kept at a minimum over the years when you say SS I think about harassment intimidation even death threats have you had any of this oh it's all of it I've been the uh, subject of the uh, what's called the fair game doctrine, which has been in existence since the mid-50s. That simply says that any one perceived as an enemy of L. Ron Hubbard or Scientology can be attacked, uh, sued, lied to, deprived of property, and even destroyed uh, without any uh, discipline or retribution from the organization. Someone has actually tried to kill you? Yes, I believe so, about uh, three or four times over the years. But not now that you're out here public? You have not received any more threats? No, not since I filed my petition. They've, they've been rather quiet since then. We're going to take a look further into that petition. We'll come right back and continue our conversation. people who are in the stages of life where you have crises. Uh, generally, it tends to be younger people. I'd say probably uh, two-thirds of their recruits tend to be younger people, young adults. But uh, they go also after widows and widowers, uh, especially a person recently widowed uh, who's, uh, who's got a lot of money. It, it, it's totally a measure of how much that person wants to do. There's no signing over of the mortgage. There's no signing over of the inheritance. If you want to get some counseling, you pay a fee, and that fee, uh, that fee is understood. And there's no future commitment beyond that. In other words, if you finish what you paid for and you don't want to do any more, you're not committed by any documents or implied agreement to, to do any more. We're continuing our look at the Church of Scientology and its missing le leader, L. Ron Hubbard. We've been joined by attorney Michael Flynn, who is defending 22 cases against the Church of Scientology. Ron Young, who's working on a biography of L. Ron Hubbard. He's a member of the Church of Scientology for the past 14 years. And attorney Harvey Silverglade. He's also representing the Church of Scientology. And let's give them all a round of applause, please. 
<laughs> Starting out, gentlemen, do you believe that L. Ron Hubbard is alive? Michael. Well, I, I don't think that it's really the critical issue in the lawsuit. The issue in the lawsuit is whether he's a missing person and whether his estate is being controlled by David Miscavige and other members of the Commodore's Message Org. My personal conclusions based on circumstantial evidence are probably that he is more likely dead than alive. Because but Because of his health, the documented health history that we've done, because of the people who were around him for the last 10 or 15 years. The church pays him at least $1.6 million. He will continue the attack, but if they pay him the money, he'll stop saying all these nasty things. Is that, you read the first page. <laughs> ask him about it. Yes, ask me. What he didn't show you is the letter that they sent to me agreeing to pay the $1.6 million to suppress the truth. That settlement got killed because they wanted documents from my clients, which I refused to give them. That's why the settlement didn't go Church through. Refused. They agreed, and I have a letter from their counsel, to the payment of $1.6 million Let them to solve it. the Scientology litigation. Let them produce the and letter. Doesn't have it. At the, in the, the summer of Why 1981. You, do you have a letter? I have the letter. Unfortunately, I don't have a letter. Right but I will, I will get it air express to you today. Did you look at that letter, please? And it's by Jay Roth, and it's dated June 17, 1982. While I'm looking at the letter, let's take a phone call. Go right ahead, please. You're on the air. Go right ahead, please. You're on the air. All righty. First of all, I'd like, to, I'd like to make a comment. Basically this. Before I got into Scientology, and this, is, this is, has to do with the allegation that Mr. DeWolf says Scientology is connected with trucks, which is, which is crazy, I was heavily into marijuana, acid, cocaine, you name it. Life was going downhill. I was going nowhere. I got into Scientology, went through a purification program, and I haven't touched drugs since, haven't wanted to touch drugs, and I'm doing great in life. So. Just a comment that really gets my goat about what Mr. Uh, DeWolf says, to think that Scientology tries to push drugs. Mm. I've seen thousands of people come off drugs, thousands. I was on staff for two and a half years. I helped many people. Uh, it really gets my goat, and it really makes me mad because I've helped so many people off drugs. And I wish we could get the spotlight not on these isolated people who have their little uh, uh, intentions for money, but let's get the spotlight on people who have gotten help from Scientology. Millions of people, millions, and you'll have millions of success stories. All right, let's see if we can get a response to this. What about, I believe it's a, called the Narconon program, or what one time was? Uh, I don't know too much about the Narconon program myself, but I don't think I said that Scientology pushed drugs. I think what I have said, uh, which is the truth and the fact of the matter, is that my father used them and uh, on himself and others uh, in his quest for personal power. And uh, he also financed drugs deals. But as far as Scientology people are concerned, they didn't use drugs that I know of. All right, let's take another phone call. Go right ahead, please. You're on the air. Anthony, and uh, I, in early November, I answered an ad in the Washington Post, and they had counselors, $10 per hour, no experience necessary. So I went to 2125 N Street, and uh, S Street, I mean. And uh, when I got there, they got me into some intensive courses. I ended up paying almost $200 for books and courses. After successfully completing the courses, I was told that counselors could not be paid for their services by the church. But if I left my money there, I would remain a member of the Church of Scientology. So I was like, I was really upset because I wanted this job, right? I went through all the courses, and they said it had been closed, like, right after I got into the program that, you know, they found this out. And then they showed me a charter where it had been in there for maybe years, since 74. So I was wondering, how can they put an ad in the paper like that? So you're saying you were you misled. Doing? Is that correct? You're saying you were misled. Right. All right. Let me ask you, gentlemen, about that, because there's this portion of whatever, this process called audit, where supposedly you, are, well, you have put the two cans in your, in your hand, and then there's some means of testing your emotional response to all this. Allegations... It's like a confessional process. It's allegations are, are raised that perhaps this is recorded and used later on to blackmail people, and that also individuals pay up to $300 or higher to go through this. But there are also stories of individuals turning over hundreds of thousands of dollars 
uh, in order to go yeah. through these different stages of purification I've, or I've, whatever. Uh, I've, uh, I've been audited myself. I've audited others. And of course, is it recorded? Notes are taken um, on this, of course. And um, the thing is, however, like, like the one person that called in earlier, Mr. Flynn and Mr. DeWolf can have to, to make, to make their money, to, in other words, to make a few million dollars, they have to raise these allegations because that's, the press will report this. Unfortunately, what is not covered, as the caller said, are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people who will swear that it changed their lives, got them off but of But what drugs. about this lady saying that she read one article in the newspaper she got there and what, in fact, was alleged in the newspaper turned out not if to that, be in If fact. that is the case, that is against the policies of the church, and she should actually write, I would say, write Mr. Silverglade. He's an attorney in Boston. If she doesn't want to write the church, she can write it to the attorney, Mr. Mm -hmm. Silverglade, who can handle the matter. Because that, if that occurred, if that occurred, because counselors are paid, and if, if that occurred, then she, she, the whole matter should be handled with her. She can handle it with Mr. Right. Silverglade. I'll well, I'd like to it. respond to one of your questions about auditing. I'm a, I've been a lawyer for the church in this litigation for three years. I have asked to see auditing files, and they wouldn't even let me see them. I finally saw them for the first time a couple of days ago on order of a judge. My own client wouldn't show me the files. That's how confidential they're kept. Carol, can I respond to that? Very quickly. I have Guardian's Program Order 12169, dated December 16th, 1969, signed by Mary Sue Hubbard, to take auditing files, call them, and blackmail people. Yep. I have the Assistant Guardian's full hat, specifically item number 38, where you play demo how to blackmail people under Guardian's Program Order 121669 to blackmail people from auditing files. I have files on top of files of people being blackmailed from cold information. All right, I have to interrupt. I want to tell the viewer that she heard here that if you were, if you feel that you did not get your money's worth or that you were misled, that you should write to Mr. Silverglade. If you did not get that information or that money, let us know so that right. we can pass that information on. And mm -hmm. if you don't have that address, please call us after the program. We'd be very happy to give you that. Take a brief pause and come right back. Thank you. Uh, it's recorded, uh, <laughs> written down. I have, but, uh, I have seen these, these handwritten uh, diaries of the auditing process, and they're filed away, and they're used later for blackmail purposes uh, if the person becomes, uh, uh, shows tendency to defect. I've never seen that happen. I've heard this before. I've heard it out alleged by different people. I've been counseling people now for 13 years, and I have never seen that happen once, ever. We have a number of questions or comments. Please stand up, please. Thank you. Barbara Briston, Springfield, Virginia. I have a question for Mr. Silverglade. Yes. Uh, could you tell me, please, who's receiving the royalties for Mr. Hubble's book, Dianetics? I have no idea, but if he wrote the book, I assume he should be getting the royalties. I don't know how much of that he would give to the church, but as far as I know, the author of the book gets royalties. It seems to me I read I, I all these tons about... of material someplace around there where there is some alleged uh, a statement that he is divesting himself for the trademark and that it should all go to some portion of the church. I've forgotten the organization. Yeah, I, I, that trademark has been given over to, uh, to, a re to a religious technology center. I'm not counsel for the center. So I don't have first-hand knowledge of that. But well, who is David. getting the money? Do you know? Well, 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 on the books, the question on the books is any author gets the royalties from the books, and he's admitted that for a long time. Yeah, that's not that's, been, that's, that's, that's secret. standard from isn't, a publishing Is that company. what you, you're well, going after this, too, isn't it, uh, Mr. DeWolf? Yeah, it should be part of the assets of the estate. Mr. DeWolf wants the royalties. <laughs> well, uh, but now, in reality, if he is his son and if the father is dead, he is entitled. Well, he's been so nice to his father. Well, I mean, but, no, it does, but you don't. Inherit now, everything Harvey, from his you father. know, as a lawyer, you do not have to be nice to inherit anything. It's just, <coughs> you know that. But it helps to be nice well, to the it, father. It may help, but you don't. I mean, let's don't mislead our audience here. You do not have to I'm be nice to inherit the anything. Yes. <laughs> um, I just wanted to make a comment that my brother was on drugs when he was 11 years old, and as a result of Scientology, he is now very successful in the army, doing really well. He's 20 years old, and he was on LSD when he was 11 years old, and it took two years of being in Scientology and working with him, and he is alive today because of Scientology. And Are you no a member of the church? Yes. Definitely. How long have you been a member? Uh, nine years. My father's a member. My brother's a member. My whole family's behind it. It has saved our lives. And she's entitled not to have her church destroyed by these people. Yes. Stand up, please. Carol, uh, I'm a former member of a large Japanese-American cult known in the United States as NSA and in Japan as the Soka Gakkai. And presently, I'm with the Citizens Freedom Foundation, which is an organization concerned about the problem of dangerous cults in the United States. Now, an ex-leader of Scientology 
because of the fact that I was involved with the Buddhist, so-called Buddhist cult, gave me a book written by L. Ron Hubbard called Hem of Asia. I have it right here. Now, what disturbs me about this book and what I'd like you to comment on about this is that this entire book, after you go through it, is dedicated to L. Ron Hubbard saying that he is fulfilling the prophecies of the original Buddha in India who said thousands of years ago that there would be a successor to him. Now the documentation or the criteria that Hubbard uses in this book after searching this out and researching it with scholars that are in a much better position to know in terms of Buddhism is, is utterly irresponsible. I mean, it can be completely refuted. My question for Hubbard's son is, how could your father uh, be so irresponsible as to write a book like this? I mean, we heard about Reverend Moon in the last court case talking about talking, uh, whether it was on the telephone or who knows what, with Buddha, Mohammed, and Jesus. Uh, it seems like L. Ron Hubbard takes it an another step further. And I'd like you to comment on this book and the lawyers or the representatives from the church to talk about it. That's an, and that's an important uh, point. One of the things that distinguishes Scientology from any other cult is that they take it, my father's taken it one step further. Uh, Scientology says very uh, simply in layman terms that you and I and everybody else uh, some 70 some odd trillion years ago uh, willed ourselves into existence and through interaction games, space wars, star wars, etc. you, I, and everybody else created this universe the matter, energy, space, and time and now we find ourselves trapped in bodies and the goal of Scientology is to untrap you from this life and untrap you from this body to return you to this godlike state but the important point difference here is is that uh, what my father did or tried to do was that he in effect said we create gods and so therefore most cults come to the point of saying well they're either equal with God one with God a special messenger of Ron, God. Ron are you saying that your father saw himself as a God? Or as the a God? God creator which is even one step worse Carol, do you Carol, realize the Old Testament says that man was created in the image of God? This is nothing new. The gentleman from the anti-cult group talks about Reverend Moon that, you know, laughing. He said he spoke to Jesus and to Buddha. That's ha, ha, ha. But, you know, there are all kinds of people in every church who believe they have communication with God, uh, including the miracle of Fatima. What about that one? Uh, I know one federal judge who said he spoke to God in order to determine a sentence he should impose in a case. Carol, Michael. responsibility of authorship is a very important factor which this gentleman raised. In one book, Dianetics, the original thesis, L. Ron Hubbard said he's a graduate of George Washington University. No, he didn't. No. It's Show, right no. in the flyleaf. The flyleaf. Bring, bring the camera up close. He studied science and mathematics he did not at George write Washington the University, graduating from Columbia College. Well, where College. would that information come from? Publisher. Publisher. Publishers but, print flyleafs. But wouldn't a publisher is supposedly is a responsible publisher? Where would they get that information Publi from? Wait, no, we're talking about the publisher, right? Publish. There's You're no saying name. that he didn't give that information to the publisher. The publisher just created it out of no, 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 the church. Right? Probably the, the church or someone like that gave it to him, or someone but, like that. Well, someone was irresponsible. He's saying he wrote it. That's not true. Somebody else wrote it, but the point is Mr. Hubbard did not. It's on a fly leaf. Give me a break, Mr. But, but, but thousands of people may be relying Maude, on that. I'm fact. just saying that if, if, you look, if I look at a fly leaf, and I do, to see the, uh, the background of an individual, I'm going to be impressed by that. Excuse me, now you're saying that that does not exist or that he wasn't responsible. If he thought it was incorrect, why didn't he correct it? Possibly his agent. After, after the fact, we come, have... Come, come, do you come, really come think on, people on. join a religion because the founder of the religion has or doesn't have a degree? We're talking about buying, reading a book. That's what we were talking about, reading a book. Not joining the religion, physical. reading a book. Yeah. I would like to address this gentleman over here. Simply, I'm amazed that he even brought that up. It's just, it's irrelevant, all right? He reminded me of the Romans saying, and this man says that he is the son of God. Mm -hmm. I don't need his help to practice or not practice my religion. I can choose my religion. Nor do you need L. Ron Hubbard. You only need yourself. You That's don't fine. need L. Ron I Hubbard, certainly don't and you need don't need to rely Flynn. on anything L. Ron Hubbard said. <laughs> Correct. I'm and that's the point. Right. That's the point. No okay. one need rely on L. Ron Hubbard, ever. I'm, unfortunately, if we have to go to a break, I'll be right back.
and that you really have to be in our studio audience to hear some of the comments that go on during the break. <laughs> it's been very lively around here. I started the program off by asking the question, is L. Ron Hubbard alive? And Ron, you said you were not sure. Michael, you said it perhaps does not even matter. Ron, what about your opinion? Is he alive or Oh, dead? yeah. He just wrote uh, Battlefield Earth. His new science fiction novel is out. He uh, finished work in December on the record album, Space Jazz. Uh, which came out, worked with Chick Corea and Stanley Clark on that, which is after the fact of... of You've uh, seen that. him? No, I haven't seen him. The others, the others have been doing the work with him. Here's the best evidence. It's Who has a, seen him, Bob? It's a letter Name written one person dated seen February 3, 1983, written by L. Ron Hubbard to the judge in the very case <laughs> that uh, his the son is suing him in. Which the judge threw out. And the judge did not throw out. He has no well, problem may, may, may I finish? <laughs> this is the a judge letter threw out. On, on, the piece of, on a piece of paper uh, Mr. Hubbard put his fingerprint. He then wrote in specially formulated ink over the, fi over the fingerprints, you see, and then afterwards he put his fingerprints again on top of that. And this letter is dated 3 February 1983, and the fingerprints were compared to the fingerprints on I the military record. I have to interrupt. Record. We have run out of time. No the question, question is, will he show up in court in April? Oh, I, that I, I don't think That is something that we don't know. I hope that you've enjoyed the show, that you've found some information out of it, that I you will also have a nice weekend, and I'll see you on Monday.